Altman. And welcome to the new and improved format of Macabre Moments. This is also our first episode in 2021. Um, but this is our new format. It's going to be Eric and I uh, choosing a topic and chatting about it. Um, occasionally we'll have a guest, but uh, one of the things that I was missing um, in doing and having Eric as my co-host recently on Macabre Moments was actually conversing with Eric. And when we have a guest on, we don't get a chance to talk to each other. And I, I, Eric, I, I'm going to go ahead and speak for you and say that you missed that as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, I mean, the last guest we had him was, was great, but I don't think you were even able to get a word in edgewise. Some, some guests like to... Talk. Which, which <laughs> is, is a good thing when you have a podcast. You want them to talk. You don't want to have to, you know, pry the information out of them. Um, right. But there's others that, yeah, just, anyway, I digress. So this is the new format that we'll be doing. Um, this month, we're going to be covering some of the new paranormal shows that have come out in 2021. Um, so spoiler alert, if you have not seen Mountain Monsters, if you have not seen Ghost, no, what is it called? Fright Club. Fright Club. Fright Club. If you have mm -hmm. not seen Paranormal Declassified, if you have not seen the Ghost Adventures Cecil Hotel <laughs> special, or the Netflix <laughs> docu-series, the four-part docu-series on the Cecil, stop watching because we were, we're definitely giving spoilers. And I mean that in more than one way. <laughs> right. So let's start with Mountain Monsters because I have some confusion that uh, I need to have cleared up. So I saw episode one of season seven, and that was, and I have a series recording set up to record all the new episodes, right? Um, so I checked this last week to see if there was a new episode, and that's when I saw there hasn't been a new episode since the first one, and that was in January. So can you explain to me what's going on with the mo uh, Mountain Monsters? Well, the Mountain Monsters show um, started out with a tribute to Trapper. That was their, their I, kickoff show. Mm -hmm. And that led into the new season. And um, the first episode, they were going to West Virginia, northern West Virginia, to look for um, this creature, supposedly wolves. Um, they weren't extinct. They were looking for wolves. Like real, and, uh, live, actual... Yes, like real, live, actual wolves. Not a cryptid. Um, no, not a cryptid. And, well, I guess you could consider it a cryptid if it's in, in that the part sense, of the country in the yeah. sense that it, they thought they were extinct or they don't exist. But they, according to Trapper's journal, which he left for the team, he gave them a mission of going to West Virginia to prove that wolf, wolves, not werewolves, not any kind of other wolves, just plain wolves, are still alive and still living in West Virginia. So they aired the first episode and then they stopped airing it on the Travel Channel and it's moved directly to Discovery Plus, and that's the only place you can see it now. So the episodes that are showing up on Travel Channel under the, the heading of Mountain Monsters are actually combined episodes of last season where they've taken two episodes and put them together as one and put a date of March whatever or February whatever. So and people they call think it that new. they're new. Yeah. Yeah. They think they're new, but they're, when in fact they're just rehashes of last year's two episodes combined into one episode. Yeah, I was super confused because I watched the wolf episode and then I watched, then they were back to Spearfinger and the Dark Forest. And I'm like, what? Yeah. And it said season six, but it was new. And I was just like, what are they doing? Like two seasons in tandem where one, they're finishing off the Dark Forest story. And then the, there's in season seven, there's, you know, starting off post trapper and back on track with normal cryptids versus all these ones they found in the book with the hooded figures and then all that business um so how many episodes have i missed because i didn't know it was on discovery plus <laughs> i think there's been seven new episodes on Aww. discovery plus and tomorrow night, if you haven't seen it or you haven't signed up for it, tomorrow night, tomorrow night is the two-part or two-hour season finale. So they're wrapping up the season. And um, there's going to be some interesting things. If you're a fan of Mountain Monsters, and I both are, yeah. 
Um, you, you may see something that the, it may be a team first, if you will. Oh. Yeah, so, I mean, they've done it for six seasons and have had horrible luck doing what they're trying to do. But you may see a team first uh, tomorrow night on Discovery+. Plus. So check it out. Um, I've been talking with uh, my good friend Jeff Headley, uh, Jeff Rowe, as he's known on the show, and Huckleberry and Buck. I talk with them from time to time and just get an update of what's going on. And yeah, Jeff assured me that uh, the season finale is coming up, and um, it's going to be a really interesting one. I think people are going to like it. And as he called it, it's going to be a first for the Mountain Monsters team. So if you if you have Discovery Plus, you can check it out as early as tomorrow morning, as a matter of fact. They start airing it first thing in the morning. Wow. So Yeah. Excellent. Well, I've got some binging to do. I've got to watch all the other episodes before I watch the finale. Yeah, it's actually been probably their best season so far because um, they started out looking for a legitimate animal, a, mm -hmm. a wolf in West Virginia, although wolves really don't exist in West Virginia. They say they do, and they, they have some compelling footage, but um, they quickly turn from looking for a wolf into looking for this thing called a smoke wolf, which is not a wolf. It's more like a... Um, a uh, wolf on steroids. Um, it's a huge black dog with glowing red eyes. They've referred to him as the Grim. Um, and this thing has apparently has supernatural abilities, and it likes to kill dogs and coyotes. And uh, they've been chasing this thing on a property called No Man's Land. And um, they had some. And all the while, this is all in Trapper's journal. What he said, he sent them on this final mission, as he calls it, from him. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been really good. Um, it's no rogue team. You're not confused by the rogue team or who's chasing who or who's doing what. It's or not people getting in trances or getting abducted or. Yeah, there's no spear finger, no like six cryptids in one or skinwalkers or hooded figures walking the doors. Nothing like that. It's all them back to their roots, if you will, looking for this cryptid called a smoke wolf. And uh, it's definitely worth checking out. Oh, I definitely will. You know, I, I'm going to watch the whole season. I just didn't realize it was on Discovery Plus or would have been watching this whole time. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm a, it's a little bittersweet for me because I'm glad to hear that they're going back to going after cryptids, like, like I said, like normal cryptids. But I got so into that twisted, dark forest, spear finger, masked man, BS that they were, you know, dealing with. They well, it was at least two seasons that they, yeah. if not three, I think it, it might have even been three that they were going yeah. down the, the black SUVs following them and all that stuff. Um, and it never, we never really got a conclusion as to who they were, right. why they were doing what they were doing, and it doesn't sound like we're ever going to get that from them. Maybe they'll do a, a, a special after the season or something. Maybe the fans will, will come at them and say, "Hey, you didn't wrap it up. Like what?" what happened with these guys in, in the black SUVs and leaving you all these clues and photographs of, of the red barn and, and or the red shed or whatever it was. Yeah, they did that in season three. They started into the whole rogue team and um, they were being followed and, and um, under surveillance and people were, I mean, they dropped little hints throughout season two. They would see somebody in the woods with a, a thermal flare or, um, somebody parked in the woods on a side by side with their lights on and they'd be like, yeah. who's that? And they go after him and they would disappear. And it all kind of culminated with the, um, the Stonish giant when they supposedly, the, the rogue team supposedly shot and killed the Stonish giant oh, and pulled it off on the tarp. Yes, yes, yes. And from there, it, the show, as much as I loved enjoying the show for what it is, it went off the rails because it really did. they got into subjects that really are hard to follow because you weren't doing one storyline. You were doing like five or six storylines at once. And they they had the rogue team chasing them. They met the rogue team, and they were sent on a journey to the dark forest to the Raven Mocker. And then it became the Lady of the Woods. Then there was a little girl they were looking for. Then there was the White Wolf. And there was just so many things that they were throwing at you, but they never came to any kind of conclusion with any of them. No. And then at the end of season three, they showed um, Huck getting into, or not Huck, but uh, Buck getting into a truck with the leader of the rogue team and driving yeah. off. And then season four started up. I believe it was season five started up. One of them, I get confused, but season five might have started up. And they were, if I'm not mistaken, they were drawn back to where Huck, or Buck, Buck disappeared in the truck. But this wasn't the rogue team. These were guys wearing scarecrow masks. 
and playing films and saying you've got to go look for the spear finger now if you want to solve the mystery. But were they really the rogue team or who were they? Were they so a whole different set of people? Yeah, yeah. they never made it clear as to who those people were. So that was added on top of it. And now you're looking for five or six different cryptids tied into this spear finger. We never found out who spear finger was. Um, we never learned anything really about her. They went and looked for all the other cryptids. They spent too much time, I think, on the uh, Waya woman. Yeah. And they, they, two episodes of that, and they, they made it short for, like, the Cherokee Death Cat and a couple of the other cryptids they were looking for. That were in and the by, book. They were, yeah, in the book. And by the time they got to the Spearfinger episode, it was the end of the season, and they left you on another cliffhanger where the Scarecrow's like, oh, we go up in this box. It's in the middle of the road. Ha, 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 ha. You know, and they, they did all this stuff to, you know, leave a... a what's going to happen next with Spearfinger? Who are these people? But they never concluded it. Unfortunately, Trapper passed away in uh, December of 2019 last year. And um, they filmed another season of it, but this was based on Trapper's journal taking them on a completely different mission, if you will. And they left the, the rogue team and the Spearfinger and all that stuff behind with no answers. So we really have no idea um, what happened to the team as far as those other quests they were on and yeah. how they were resolved or who spear finger was, who the rogue team was. So hopefully this season gets them back on track to just hunting individual cryptids rather than trying to do a storyline and throw eight or nine pieces of whatever at the wall and hope it sticks. It kind of turned into a paranormal soap opera. It did, but it would have been easier to follow. Just my opinion, it would have been easier to follow if it would have been one or two storylines Yeah, yeah. rather than, okay, who stuck a, a skull up Jeff's nose? And what was the purpose of that? Um, yeah, the what happened to the woman of the woods? What happened to Spearfinger? I mean, they left you so many questions, too many questions. And Huck, Huckleberry, Huckleberry going into his trance under the waterfall and, and getting all weirded out, you know, yeah, and Buck it. going down the tunnel of the, uh, of the wicker where the, the fire and the lady of the woods, or I think it was, that's what they were calling her at that point, was the, the woman of the woods was at the end of, the, of that wicker tunnel. Yeah. yeah, a lot of it just did not make sense, and it was hard to follow. Now, this season is easier to follow because they're looking for one particular cryptid, and they're staying on storyline for that one cryptid. So it is a lot easier to follow. So back, um, back to the normal um, formula, the, the initial original formula. I hope so, because um, this one has been pretty good, and I know fans are enjoying it. And um, I guess we'll have to see if there's going to be any more. Um, talking with Jeff, he's confident they will have another season. But for Mountain Monster fans, if they don't, there is some good news. And, and you and I have talked a little bit about this offline. There's a new series that they just launched on um, Discovery Plus called Mountain Monsters um, Beyond the Fire or um, Next to the Fire or something like that. And I, I can't remember the exact name of it, but it's them watching old episodes of the show and cutting up and joking around and, and making comments and picking on each other. And uh, it, it's it's fun to watch. I mean, they've done four episodes so far, and um, they've been they've been enjoyable. But um, I don't know how long that's going to last. Um, but according to Jeff, he thinks it's going to go on for a while because, as you know, they've got seven seasons worth of shows and probably 10, 10 episodes a season. So they at least have 70 shows worth. And plenty to poke fun at. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the guys like to make fun of each other. And I mean, other, yeah, so. yeah. I mean, that's what that's like the whole principle of the, of the around the campfire or whatever it's called is. Yeah. More lighthearted, you know, fun, jovial. Right. So, and, and, and what I like about that, um, uh, I don't want to say episode, but that segment that they do. Um, I, their, their true personalities really come out when they're sitting around the fire and they're, you know, making their quips and, and comments about what they're seeing on the screen. Right. Yeah. It, it's more of them being laid back and like you said, being themselves and yeah. cutting up and having fun. And that, I enjoyed it. I, I've watched the four episodes so far and they're fun. Um, they're nothing like, you know, hunting like they do on their normal show. It's just them sitting around in campfire chairs and, Watching, you got a projector uh, on the side of the barn, and yeah, yeah watching the, yep. the old shows. So if you're a fan of that kind of stuff, um, and you can't get enough of the Mountain Monsters guys, the Ames team, they're, uh, they have a new show, Mountain Monsters Near the Fire, or Beyond the Fire, or Around the Fire, or In the Fire, or something like that. <laughs> something about the fire. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't start the fire, but um, yeah, 
the Billy Joel joke. They, I was <laughs> going to say, anyways. they certainly did start the <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, that's on Discovery Plus, too. That's They aired one episode on um, the Travel Channel, and then they never aired anything after that. Yes, so you, that's you the one I saw. It. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned it to me, and I'm like, I don't think that's a new show. But it turns out it is a new show, and it's only going to be on Discovery Plus. And okay. for those fans who like Travel Channel paranormal shows, they're running a lot of reruns right now. And they're going to be running a lot of reruns, and they're trying to get everybody over to Discovery Plus. So all the new shows are going to be only on Discovery Plus. Might as well just pay for that subscription now, people, because you're going to need yep. it. Yeah. A lot of shows going on to Discovery Plus. Speaking yep. of shows on Discovery Plus, um, let's move on to the Ghost Adventures special, the investigation <laughs> of the Cecil Hotel. Oh my gosh! Now, the, the train wreck on wheels. Like yeah, that. it it was it it was bad. It was yeah. really bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> it was really bad. <laughs> first of all, I will say their B roll I thought was in very bad taste. Um, there's so many other different things they could have used in their B roll than what they used, and I I just I thought that was in bad taste. Um, secondly, their lack of knowledge of the subject, they didn't have, they had some knowledge, but there was a lot more going on. In fact, for the record, Elisa Lamb, when she stayed at the Cecil Hotel, now I can go on, I'm about to go on a 10 hour tangent. I'm, I'm just going <laughs> to squash it down to like a two minute one. Elisa Lamb was on the fourth floor until her final night. Then she, mm -hmm. she was... Which we learn in if if you've watched the four part Netflix documentary about the Cecil Hotel, um, her last night at the hotel she, she it, it the the Cecil is set up kind of like a hostel, so you can get shared rooms at and you you pay less but you share your room with a stranger and you you, you share a bathroom and it's weird but that's what they do or what they did. Um, so she had a shared room with some people and she had, was starting to uh, behave erratically and they had been complaining that she was um, leaving notes on their bed to leave and get out. And so the Cecil actually moved her to the fifth floor for her final night. Um, but I don't believe the Ghost Adventures ever went on the fifth floor. And that was where she stayed her last night, the night she took the elevator up to the 14th floor. Um, and then a huge missed opportunity huge missed opportunity two actually first one um on top of the fact that they weren't in the right room um richard ramirez's room they had access that whole when i investigated the hotel it was open and people were staying there right mm -hmm. if, are you kidding me right now they had the entire hotel to themselves it was empty and they knew what room was richard ramirez's room they knew which one it was how much freaking time did they spend in that room? Maybe I five think, minutes? Yeah, enough for the um, psychic Marty and uh, Marty Michael Perry. Michael and Marty Perry. Yeah. I, yeah, and, and I like Michael and Marty Perry. They're, they're, I think they're really good people. Oh, I love them. People, uh, yeah. and they do great work. Um, and but, uh, I was I, fascinated, but... What pissed me off about that, Eric, is they put that artwork in that, in that room, in Richard Ramirez's room. It was Richard Ramirez's artwork that they put in his room didn't tell Mar my marty when she was in there mm -hmm. and I, I i mean i would be i don't know i'd be a little irritated if i was her right like okay you put me in a serial killer's room with an and you put his own artwork in there and you're not gonna give me any kind of like if you're gonna put him in the serial killer room great fine don't throw trigger objects in there too and make it worse do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you want to get her impression of, of the room and, and who was in it, but you don't need to add fuel to the fire. I think that's why they did that. I think they put her in there without telling her that it was Richard Ramirez's room so that she could pick up on what was there without yeah, knowing Yeah, that it. part I get, but, but putting that artwork in there was unnecessary did, did she, and dangerous. I, I can't remember if she saw the artwork or not. I don't know if she saw it laying on a table or something or if she just went in and started drawing. No, she, no, it was in the closet, in a closed closet. She had no idea it was in there. Oh, then, yeah, then I wouldn't put too much stock in it being there. 
um, simply because they want her to, to go in to do a cold reading, so to speak, not knowing the history, who was in the room, to see if that trigger object actually brought Richard forward and he could communicate think, with her. Well, but do we need a trigger object? He, he stayed in that room for the entire time he committed all of his crimes. It's, that's where he lived. So this is, what, this is what I'm saying about a missed opportunity. First of all, <laughs> <laughs> putting Mar Marty in there of course, you don't want to um, front load her. So, no, you don't tell her whose room it is. I agree right. with that. What I disagree with was putting the artwork in the closet and not telling her. Because there's a potential for if Richard Ramirez is still lingering around, and, or if he's attached to that artwork in particular, then that's putting Marty in danger that she's not necessarily aware of. Put her in the room and not tell her whose it is. Yes, I agree with throw artwork that's done by Richard Ramirez in the room that I didn't agree with. Does well, that make sense? It does, but that's, that's what Zach does. He doesn't think. So, uh, well, I mean, I agree with him putting her, putting her in the room to, to try to get her impression, her first impression or initial impression of what she was sensing is, is a good idea. I don't, you don't ever want to front load a psychic because right. you want them to really pull in information that they're getting and you don't want to give them you know, the opportunity to know what they're doing in advance. But in this case, I don't think it really mattered much if she knew it was there or not. I don't think it really resulted in much other than her drawing some sketches that, I mean, they really didn't do any harm. Right. But other than that, I mean, like I said, the, the show was a train wreck. It really was. Um, they did so many things that just were dumb and just, in my opinion, unnecessary, and the, the overacting was just terrible. Oh, my God, you hear that scream? Oh, my God. Yeah, it was just horrible. Yeah. Do you know how much noise you can hear from the sidewalk, even when you're yeah. on the 14th floor? My room yeah. was, yeah, okay. Yeah, and Aaron wandering off and walking to a window. They think he's going to jump out a window. He's not going to jump out that a window. That was the window looking. right by my room, Eric, when I stayed there, that window. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But, no, he's not jumping out of no window. No. I mean, they're getting to be as bad as Mountain Monsters. <laughs> <laughs> At least with Mountain Monsters, you well, like the characters. They're making a recovery. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They, they're, they're decent people. <laughs> yeah, you like the people on Mountain Monsters. I, Aaron's okay, and the other, the other guys on the show are okay. I, I'm just not, just not a fan of Zach. Yeah, I, I've never I, liked Zach from the beginning. No, I haven't either, and he's just gotten worse over time. Yeah, unfortunately. as he's, you know, uh, I'm just not a fan of his, and and I don't know him personally. I've never met him. I mean, he might be the greatest guy in the world when you meet him in person, but just from what I've seen of him on TV and what I've heard other people say about you know his personality, I just don't have any desire to meet the guy or to be friends with the guy. Yeah, I don't either. I don't either. And I just I don't I don't know why they didn't spend more time in Richard Ramirez's room. Um, they didn't even bring up Jack Unterweger, who was an, the other serial killer that stayed in there. Uh, or the, maybe they brought him up, but they didn't go to his room. Oh, they might have went to his room. I think Re they did. Refresh me. But the, yeah. but only for, it's not like they investigated the No, room. they were they, they were in the room for a little while, and they did some, some um, things to try to draw him out, but it didn't. According to them, it worked, but I wasn't impressed with what they were getting. I wasn't Their little either. little shack hacks and little ovuluses saying words that, they program it prior to, they obviously they program prior to doing the search so those words are going to come up during the show right so just my opinion I, i'm not a fan of ghost adventures to begin with and this was a discredit to the cecil hotel and for real and researchers such as yourself that have looked into the the case and, and spent time there and done investigations it's a discredit to, to people like you because they, it just it was horrible it was it was, it was bad it was really bad yeah if, so I skip did, it yeah <laughs> right skip it Stay don't, away. Don't watch it. Now, there was another uh, special on Netflix. It was a four-part docu-series about the Cecil Hotel, the history of the hotel, but mostly about the Elisa Lamb case. It did go into a little bit of the history of the, the stuff that had happened before she had been there. Um, what and Okay, so the documentary is worth a watch, um, I think. Just but but you know that I'm very passionate about this case. I've I've gone and investigated this case. I've yeah. written a book about the case. It's not published yet, but I've written a book. So um, I say it's worth the watch. What was your opinion of the docu series? Well, like I, I we discussed off 
air prior to coming on today. I thought it was very dry. It was. Um, and it, it's it's most of the stuff you already know. And they really didn't get into too much more detail about the, the things like the two serial killers that were there, some of the other deaths that occurred in the, in the hotel and the murders and the suicides. suicides. Um, they, they touch base on a lot of that, but they focus mainly on Elisa Lamb. And a lot of that information has already been out there. Um, and they tried to, what I didn't like about it the most was the fact that they had some really weird twists. Like they tried to blame the, the conspiracy theorists tried to blame a Mexican music musician named yeah. Morgan and said he was the killer just because he stayed at the, the Cecil one night and he was writing music about that people put coincidences together and said, Oh, that's about Elisa, Lisa lamb. And he, he just wrote music and they try to personally attack him and call him a, mur a murderer and said he was responsible and come clean. And, and he really wasn't involved. No, so they, no. They, in fact, w he had posted a video of himself at the Cecil and he was like, Oh, I'm at the Cecil hotel. But he was at the Cecil hotel like months before Elisa lamb even came. No one even, it's like, I don't, I don't know if that post had a, like a, a date stamp, but they should have put it together, these, these armchair sleuths. Now, what, the one guy that they kept going to, the, I don't know if they called him, um, a, 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 the YouTuber. Yeah. Yeah. I watched a lot, uh, I watched a lot of his videos during, especially initially, when I was initially re researching the case, the Elisa Lam case, he was like the main guy that he was throwing stuff up daily about the Elisa Lam case and what was going on. And so I was really surprised to see him on the show. Um, I, I could see why they picked him because he had so much content, right? He, like I said, he was doing like daily YouTube episodes about what was going on with the case, but he went down seven or eight different rabbit holes of what potentially happened to Elisa Lam on his YouTube channel. And most of them were so off the charts, wackadoodle, not even possible. Like just one of them was, uh, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard maybe one theory is that she um, was involved with a government, the government yeah. and a secret weapon. Yeah. I think they mentioned it in yeah, the docuseries. They yeah. Did. The, the invisibility cloak or whatever. And yeah, there, there were so many really bad conspiracies and they kept bringing these conspiracy theorists up. And I understand it's part of the story, but some of their stories and their, their thoughts were so far out there. Um, it was just like, really, come on. You know, the whole she was a government spy and, and they purposely killed her and then the police covered it up or no, the hotel killed her and then the hotel <laughs> covered it yep. up and just so many wacky things that it was just like, oh, come on, guys, <laughs> just give it a rest. Right. Now, um, I have no doubt the Cecil Hotel is haunted um, because of all the, the tragic just it's such a dark place. And I, I'm sure that there's something horrible there. But the documentary barely touched on any of that that side of things the paranormal side of things they, they did talk a little bit about richard ramirez and um the other serial killer and some of the deaths and suicides which is fine but i give it out of five stars i would give it maybe two it just wasn't that great of a documentary for me but what i find funny is in the if you watch the very beginning of the first episode when they showed like the director and producer um ron howard's name comes up yeah yeah i saw that and if he's the ron howard from happy days and does all those really well, he's you know, doing directing and blockbuster producing movies now. yeah yeah if if he's responsible for that he'd really drop the ball on this one it was yeah. just not a good documentary and that's just my opinion people may watch it and they might love it and think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread but just to me i, I was hoping for more i was hoping for more meat and potatoes but it was really dry they just give us two pieces of bread and said here you go here's your poop sandwich <laughs> in four episodes in four but episodes there was little grains of goodness and the grains of goodness i found in the hotel manager okay she was creepy as fuck yeah she, yeah she was a little weird she was creepy and she was like like the way she was <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and and then she's like, like defending the hotel. She was constantly defending the hotel, you know? Well, and, and... yeah. I can see her doing that because she worked there for 10 years and, and 
she's maybe afraid of getting sued by the hotel. Who knows? But well, yeah, she from, was weird. from what I learned from the documentary, it's, it, it's been sold. Again? So it, apparently it closed in 2019 Mm -hmm. Okay. and someone bought it and they're going to like refurbish it. They talked about it in the documentary they, and they talked about how on the roof they were talking about putting a reflecting pool for Oh. like guests. When you go on the roof, they're going to make like this rooftop like a uh, party atmosphere with a bar and but and a reflecting pool dog a girl died in a water tank on that roof she floated in that tank for 19 days you're gonna put a reflecting pool up there Sure, again why not? poor taste no <laughs> no why not? Let's have a party. Come on. Let's capitalize on Lisa Lamb well because and all poor that horrible. poor Well, you know, maybe that's what the whole concept is, right? Mm hmm Pour a little Yeah, out for Elisa. yeah well, they're, they're doing that, and they, I mean, they think they can draw people to that hotel because of its history and because of its reputation, and why not put all this crap in there and you come have a party with Elisa Lamb spirit. Come Ugh. hang out with the, the dead spirit of Richard Ramirez. I mean, it's stupid, and I agree they shouldn't do it. It's in poor taste, but they're probably trying to just capitalize on things. Yeah. But but if you watch the documentary, they said that it was sold before. So um, it was sold for like $25 million or something in years 27 ago. well oh yeah that's when they switched it to um to the stay Yeah. i think that was before elisa that Right. was before Long yeah before yeah that. yeah So when you said they so sold then it, they sold it again. yes It was sold again, I should say. it was sold again and then Right. after it was sold again once it was this last buyer has shut it down it that's why it was vacant for the ghost adventures because it's not currently operating and i don't anticipate he's going to reopen under the cecil or under the stay Um, which now means the footage that I took in California and I've got hours because my intention was to make a documentary when I went to investigate the Cecil. And it wasn't until after I got home that I looked up the laws in California laws in California state. You have to have a permit to film in any public space in California in, in LA, right? Because Mm it's hmm it's movie land, right? Yeah. But now that the Cecil's closed, I think I can use that footage and I can create my documentary because But the is it is it still public space though? it's public space, but it's not the Cecil. It's going to be something else. Right, but if it's still public space, would you still need a permit? I don't know. I'd, This is I'd what look I got into to that. figure out. Yeah, Yeah. I got, definitely have to look into it. Um, but I've got my fingers crossed that I might actually be able to do more than just my little 30 minute thing that I've got on my YouTube channel right now. So Um, all right. I think we're down to two more shows, right? Yeah. And these. Yeah, so so just recapping. Don't watch the Ghost Adventures, <laughs> Cecil Hotel, and <laughs> don't watch the Netflix four-part episode of the Cecil Hotel. They're well, horrible. my vote is you should maybe watch it. If you want to, I don't know, give it a shot. If you can't get through it, you can't get through it. If you can, you can't. If you if you're really into the Elisa Lamb case, you should watch it. There's some sh there's some stuff in there that that kind of ticked me off a little bit. Um, I really and and this has always bothered me about this case. This is one of the things that bothers me about this case is that everybody's really quick to just um, dismiss it to her um, her mental situation. You know, she was bipolar, um, and I a I, I just. I think that's an easy out and people are just taking that as an easy out. I really don't think that that it could have been a contributing factor, but I don't think that's what caused her to go into the tank. I don't think we'll ever really know, but that's what the police, that's what the, the um, psychiatrist who was on the, the Netflix show, all these professionals at the, the very end of season four or episode four was, that's what they wrote it off to is she didn't take her meds. That's why her, her counts were low in her body when they did the toxicology Well, then report. they, they, they knew her, where her meds were um, from her prescription. The, the toxicology, she had been in the water too long. So they, di they didn't really get a lot out of her body. Well, the, As far the psychiatrist, if I'm not mistaken, she said that her medications were lower than normal because she hadn't taken them. 
that's why she was acting as crazy yeah, as she and the, was. And the, and the reason they knew that is because the date the prescription was filled. And she, let's say she's supposed to take one tablet a day yeah. and it was filled on the 10th. And now we're looking at the 20th. There should have been 10 tablets gone and there was only three gone. Okay. Well, they were speculating that her that, so, bipolar was worse because right. she didn't take her pills. And, and they, were all, they were all talking. Like I said, they neatly wrapped it up in that last episode saying here's the reason it has nothing to do with the serial killers or being murdered or being drawn by a mysterious force she did it herself well if i was if i mean if you were going to kill yourself and you were at a hotel and you go up to the 14th floor and you walk down i mean you walk you find that open window on the 14th floor you go out onto the fire escape why not just jump off the fire escape? What, or ju she she obviously climbed the, the fire escape to the ladder. There's no doubt in my mind about that. She climbs the fire escape up to the roof. Why not jump off the roof? Why would you climb into a water tank? And then here's the thing, Eric. Here's the other thing that really, really bothers me. When they found her, they found her naked. And, but the clo it was the clothes that she was wearing in the, in the elevator, in the last footage. Right. The, right? So my theory, and, and, they, and they also said this in the documentary, is she took off the clothes because she was trying to stay Tread afloat. Yes. And it was you know easier to swim with her clothes off. So she got her clothes off to keep from drowning. Right. Um, so if she wanted to kill herself, why wouldn't she just jump off the building? And why did she try to stay alive once she got into the tank? Well, if you recall, the psychiatrist laid it out pretty pretty well, I thought, and she made some good points that because she wasn't on her medication, she was hallucinating and paranoid thinking someone was chasing her. And she, when she kept looking out in the elevator on the hallway, yep. she was seeing somebody that wasn't there. It was all hallucination. And she felt afraid of being chased by somebody. So therefore she escaped to the ladder, or to the window, up the ladder on the roof. And when she got to the tank, she thought, I would, I'll hide here because they're not going to find me. And she fell in realizing, oh, crap, I'm, there's no way I can get out. And then she's stuck. And then she figured, well, maybe I'll try to keep afloat. She took her clothes off, and then she ended up drowning. So that's what they they summarized version of what, what they felt she would happen to her. So whether or not that, that's really what happened, that's that's their summary based yeah, on no, I mean, if, the medication. If you're hiding from even a hallucination, you could still hide behind the tank. You don't have to get in the tank, right? Like, well, how did she I, even know there was an opening to those tanks? They were on the top. She might have climbed up. I, I don't know. I, I like wasn't there. Um, like I said, you know more about this case than I do. But watching the documentary, the impression I got was from the psychiatrist standpoint. She was in the elevator. She felt paranoid. She felt like somebody was chasing her. That's why she kept reacting the way she was and kept looking out and back in and... and um, the reason the elevator wouldn't go anywhere is because she pushed all those buttons. And then finally she went out of the elevator, went down the hallway, found the open window thinking she was being chased up to the roof. And she's still thinking she's being chased. She found the, the water tank and thinking, I'll climb up there and hide. He won't find me in here. Well, she got up there, went in and died, unfortunately. And couldn't, couldn't get back out. Couldn't yeah. get back out. Right. So Depending that's on their... how full the tank was, right? Right. And, and as they said, if it would... If I remember correctly, the police officer said if that tank would have been full, she could have easily pulled herself out. Yeah, yeah. But if they're drinking the if it water, was like half full. Yeah, and it's going down, she and can't she's reach. yeah, and in order, she was thinking, well, if I'm not weighing as heavy because of the wet clothes, maybe I can float longer. So she took the clothes off. They sunk and, to and the maybe, bottom. Yeah, got to And then back. she just yeah, she just ended up couldn't float anymore and died. That's the police's story. Yeah. Whether or not that actually happened, we don't, we'll never know. Right. We'll never have answers to the, the Lisa, Lam case, Lisa Lam case, and it'll always be a huge mystery. Mm -hmm. And you'll always have the conspiracy theorists and the paranormal fans, and you'll have the, the, the forensic scientists or the psychiatrists or police are saying this is how it ended. You're never going to get a, a real conclusive answer to this, which makes it a, a really fascinating mystery and unfortunately a tragic story for Lisa Lam. Yeah, really sad story indeed yeah. um but i might add that she had also just been at the last bookstore right before she came back to her hotel 
and was bringing gifts back. She had bought books and was telling the clerk that she was concerned about traveling with the weight of the books. So in a matter of two hours, she said, well, if she's hallucinating, okay, all right, I'll let it go for now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a huge rabbit hole, no, no matter which way you go, because there's always twists and turns and what ifs and so many unanswered questions. And it, it, I think, I don't think the story will ever get solved. I mean, to some people, the police or whoever, it's solved and it's done with. But there's always going to be questions that are never going to be able to be answered. Yeah, I know. I know. It sucks. Yeah. It sucks. All right. So the <laughs> our remaining two shows, um, these ones are really exciting. The first one um, okay. was Paranormal Declassified. And the reason I'm so excited to talk about these two is because Eric made an appearance on these two shows. So tell us about your experience on Paranormal Declassified. Um, in... I want to say September, I was uh, contacted by a producer and they were looking for, they were coming to Pennsylvania to film an episode on Bigfoot and they were looking for different types of angles for the show. And one of these angles was Bigfoot makes these structures, um, whether they be huts or nests or lean bedding to. areas, lean tos, whatever. Um, they were fascinated by all these pictures they were finding online of these possible places where Bigfoot could hang out at. And they asked me if I knew some, knew of anything like that. And over my research over the past 24 years, I've found a couple of these weird looking structures, whether they're sleeping bag looking things or nests on the ground, you know, branches are laid in special areas or specific areas, or even lean to type structures, igloo looking domes or whatever you want to call them. I found several of these. So I sent pictures of what I had found to this producer. And he wrote me back and said, we want you on the show to talk about these. Can you get us more information? I said, well, there's really not much more that I have. And I don't know much more than what I've found because no one really has the answer if Bigfoot uses these nests or whatever. But long story short, um, they contacted me in early October and said, we're coming to film in late October. We want you on the show. This is where we want, want you to meet us. And they had me meet them at a, um, it's an abandoned Coke works out, just outside of downtown Pittsburgh which is supposedly very haunted, but it has nothing to do with Bigfoot. So when they emailed me and asked me to meet them, I was like, what does this have to do with Bigfoot? Why aren't we, why aren't we meeting in the, the In the forest? woods, yeah. And they're like, well, Paul's going to be in the woods. He's the host of the show. And uh, he's going to be in the woods, and he's going to be doing his interviews, and, and then most of them at different locations, but not in the woods. So he's going to be spending some time in the woods and then talking to you at the uh, this Coke Works place. So I agreed to it. Um, went and filmed a three-hour interview with them. They got edited down to about a minute and 59 seconds. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty quick. Yeah, very quick. And But, but it was very well done. Well, I, I, they, they did edit it to their needs because when we talked about he, – he showed me – he pulled out the camera and he showed me pictures of this lean-to that he found. And I looked at the pictures and I said, it's very intriguing, but it's a lean-to and it looks like it was made by people. And it doesn't look like it was made by Bigfoot, but more like something, a Boy Scout group or, you know, a survivalist weekend or something like that, or even a camper right. might make in the woods. It, I really, it's intriguing that they put a, a live tree and use that as a base to tie everything together to, but it, it was made with intent and it was more likely made by people. So they cut that all out and edited it as TV does to make it sound like I was agreeing with him saying that's really suspicious and a Bigfoot could have made that when in fact... I wasn't sure. You know, it looked to me like a lean-to that you find in the woods with Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts would do. Um, so there was that, and of course they asked me my take on the Bigfoot subject, which they didn't change my words on, which I was thankful. And I basically said the only way we're ever going to solve this mystery is if we find a body or produce a corpse, you know, or catch a live specimen. That's the only way science is going to accept this. Yeah. And they left that in the show, which I was happy for. But uh, I'm. It was fun to meet Paul and to do the three hours of filming, and we, we talked on so much stuff that didn't get, it, it didn't make it into the show. And uh, somebody asked me, well, Chestnut Ridge, where they filmed this at, that's a huge area. And I said, yeah, it's, it's 100 miles long, and it runs from Indiana County all the way um, in a southwesterly direction into Preston, West Virginia. And they said, well, the, on the show, they made it look like a little community called Chestnut Ridge. 
I said, well, there is a little community called Chestnut Ridge on the Chestnut Ridge, but that's not where all the Bigfoot stuff goes on. All the Bigfoot activity is all up and down the ridge. It's not just one specific location. So I think the producers got the name of the Chestnut Ridge and this little village mixed up, and they went to this little village. Oh. And this little village is, is surrounded by like four or five very populated little cities and a, a big town in southwestern Pennsylvania, Uniontown, Pennsylvania. That's a pretty populated city. So this little community is right outside of Uniontown, and anybody, people could be there you know, hiking, camping, yeah. whatever. So them going there was kind of a a faux pas on their part, simply because they, they went to the village of Chestnut Ridge rather than going to different places on the Chestnut Ridge. But again, overall, it was a fun um, experience with them. Um, Paul was a great guy to talk to. Um, I did watch the episode, um, I've seen it like four or five times now, um, and I go through and critique it. And yeah, my, my, my spot in it was okay. Um, Stan Gordon's spot was okay. Jeff yeah. Meldrum's spot was okay. Um, uh, the area that they're talking about, um, and I think it's, what's it called? Uh, the Tiger Forest, um, the Tiger Woods or something like that. It's in southeastern Ohio. And it's a very active area right now for Bigfoot sightings and experiences. And why they didn't just stick on that area is beyond me because they've, they've got a ton of stuff going on there. But don't get me wrong. I'm grateful they came to Pennsylvania and filmed me for my two little yeah. minutes of, of fame to get on the show. And it was fun. It was fun. Um, unfortunately, it didn't accomplish what I hoped it would have accomplished. I was hoping that it would have brought more people out of the woodwork to share their experiences and sightings with me so I could follow up on more cases. I don't think I've gotten one sighting report from that TV show. A lot of compliments, a lot of people saying, you know, we really liked it, but I was hoping that it would draw people out to, um, to report experiences and encounters and it didn't. But well, anybody that's currently watching, if you have had any encounters in the Chestnut Ridge, hit up Eric Waltman because he'd like to hear from you. So the last show we're going to talk about, (sighs) (laughs) yeah that sums it up eric it's called fright club and it is hosted by jack osborne and the ghost brothers yes um the ghost brothers i think ran for one season maybe two two. yeah and i they had a a spinoff so it was total three they had a Mm spinoff what was it called ghost in no, it was um, Ghost Brothers Haunted Residence or Haunted Haunted Homes or something like that. Oh, where they, actually, d- they stayed the weekend in the person's house. So. Uh, okay, I'm really glad I didn't even know about that one. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> it's on. So, it's on Dis- Discovery Plus. Not gonna watch it. Okay, so um, Fright Club. You made an appearance on Fright Club as well. Now this this is super exciting for. A, a multiple reasons. Number one, you talked to the son of the Prince of Darkness. Yes, I did. How, what, what was that like talking to Jack Osborne? Um, the night they filmed it was actually here in my basement. And if you watch the episode, you'll see the stuff on the back wall. You see me and the stuff on the back wall. But um, they didn't tell me who was who the hosts were. And um, they, they had me sit in the base for almost three and a half hours. I was supposed to film at eight and by 1130, they finally brought me on. And I kept telling him, I got to work in the morning. I, I can't stay if it's going to go long because I got to be up at three o'clock. So they were, they were interviewing other people as well, apparently, but they never told me who the hosts were. They just had me looking at a blue screen and said, your host will be with you momentarily. And, and it was all done through, um, through zoom or Skype or something like that. I think it was Skype, but, um, so I'm waiting, and they said, okay, you're coming up. Your segment's next. They're going to do a whole interview with you about the, the uh, information. And I submitted a couple of audio clips to them that I captured uh, and Sean Dennis had captured in um, Farmington, Pennsylvania on his property. Now, a little backstory about that real quick. Sean I wanted, is, I, so this is what the editing part was the evidence that you brought to the show. Yeah. Yeah. Continue. Um, well, let's, let's go back to how I brought on and met those guys, and I'll talk about the evidence in a minute yeah, yeah. here. So um, the screen pops up, and I see four guys sitting in their studio, 
and Jack Osborne is sitting in the, the, the lone chair, and then the Ghost Brothers are sitting on the side. And I'm like, wait a minute, that's that's the Ghost Brothers, and oh my god, that's Jack Osborne. And I didn't expect it. And they were very, very, very nice. They were like, hey, Eric, how you doing? And, and they were really friendly, and they asked me questions about the, the audio that I submitted. And they didn't air those, because we talked for about 20, 25 minutes about you know all that stuff and uh, how I got it. That I told them the whole story, which I'll, I'll tell you about the evidence here in a minute. And um, they asked me, you know, weren't you worried about if you're making calls, what they mean? And if possible, this thing might think it's a mating call or making it angry. And I said, well, we don't know what it means. We really don't. We're just going out there trying to elicit a response back. And that's what we got. And um, they were like, oh, before you go, can you do a whoop call for us? And I'm like, well, this is what we do. I usually do a yell, like a type of yell, like Bobo does and from Finding Bigfoot. Yeah. And then I do a whoop call, which a lot of researchers do because primates do whoop calls. Um, certain primates do like a whoop type of call. So um, I did that and they, they loved it. They were all like, oh, let's do it. Whoop, whoop, whoop. And they all started dancing around and whooping and ho- whooping and hollering whooping and having and fun hollering. with it. Yeah, and having fun with it. And then that was fun. And then it just ended. So it was like, okay, well, 20 minutes. Uh, I really hope they don't air my segment because, <laughs> I mean, it was nice to meet Jack and, and the, the guys from uh, Ghost Brothers. They're really cool guys. Um, and I had a lot of fun talking to them. But it just seemed like it wasn't a great interview. It was just kind of like, eh. It really well but I mean, to, yeah. to, to be fair though you know you were sitting there in front of a screen waiting for almost three hours so i mean you know and you got to get up to go to work the next day and so it might have been a little aggravated a little bit it wasn't, it wasn't aggravated i was just tired tired yeah i was just like let's get this over with i gotta go to bed yeah you know, like I'm can not... you can and you i kept do... telling the producer i'm like can you move me up or something because i gotta get up at three o'clock in the morning for work and they go, oh, we're trying, we're trying, just be patient a couple more minutes. And I'm like, you said that 20 minutes ago. And so it was, it was, it was a little frustrating, yeah, because I was hoping to, to do the interview at 8 when they told me to be there at 8, but then to push me three and a half hours back. And I understand it's television. This stuff happens. Yeah. You know, but Okay, so how did you come across this evidence? Because it was very compelling. Oh, yeah. It, it's probably one of the best pieces of audio evidence I've ever captured and Sean's captured. And how that came to be is um, it was Memorial Day weekend of 2012. And Sean and I had been friends for a few years. I mean, he's actually, he was a member of the Pennsylvania Bigfoot Society. He lives in the Chestnut Ridge in Farmington, PA. And he owns like a three or four acre farm that's surrounded by woods. And that that area he's in is notorious for Bigfoot activity. And um, it was in the evening, probably about six, seven o'clock. Sean, had been, Sean owns a property that has on the left side of the property, it has a small pond and a boathouse. And then there's a walking path that goes around the pond, divided by pine trees, uh, and then a yard, and then his house. So the pond sits here. Okay. There's a, a path that goes this way. There's a grove of pine trees here, that, a little hillside, opens up into a big yard, and then his house sits here. Well, that night, Sean went up to the boathouse and then he was just sitting up at the boathouse by himself because that's where he likes to go to get away from the world. And um, he's sitting there and he hears thunder coming in the distance. So he's thinking, oh, it's, it's going to rain. I've got a little bit of a walk to go. He's walking with a cane at the time. So he knew it would take him some time to get back to the house. And that trail that goes along the pond is very rocky. So he's walking with a cane and his attention is focused on the trail so he doesn't trip or fall and He's taking his time walking along the trail. His son and his son's friends were out on the front porch of the house. They can't see the boathouse. They can't see Sean, but they can see the backside of the the grove of pine trees, the little patch of pine trees between them and where the boathouse is. And they they know Sean's up there, but they they can't see him. And as they're looking up the the yard towards the the pond, they see a very tall, muscular, broad-shouldered, hair-covered creature standing there in this grove of trees, looking in the direction where they know their dad is so they're look they're looking at this thing they know it's watching their dad but they don't know their their dad's literally walking Whoa. right into the thing <sighs> and he's walking along the trail and he's not paying attention he's looking down and they start yelling hey dad dad look there's something there in the trees and all of a sudden this thing turns and bolts down this little embankment and grade um, and downgrade 
into the yard, runs through the backyard, up into the forest, and disappears. Sean was oblivious. He never saw a thing, never heard anything, because his focus was on the ground. Right. The boys saw this creature. They saw it run. They saw it run into the back forest behind the house and disappear. When Sean got back to the house, they were all excited and upset and, and just panicked and flipping out, and they told him what happened. So Sean calls me on the phone and says, you're not going to believe this. My son just saw a Bigfoot, and I was less than 15 feet away from it and didn't even know it was there. So myself and another researcher named Dwayne, we, we were like, can we come down? He's like, yeah, get down here. So we went down two days later when I, my work schedule freed up. We went down. Sean showed us where this thing was standing from the boy's point of view. We could see a trail of something that went down through the, the tall weeds that left a real distinctive trail into the yard, and he pointed the direction where the kids saw it run off. We talked to the boys. They cooperated the story. They told us everything they saw. And by that time, we were like, yeah, there's probably still around here if it was just two days ago. So can we do a nighttime investigation at your boathouse by the pond and play broadcast sounds, predator calls? I can do some wood knocks. You can do some wood knocks. We can do some whoop calls and see if we can get any kind of response. Well, Sean's house sits probably maybe 50 yards from this main country road. And it's not a main country road, but a a fairly traveled country road. You could hear cars going by up and down all night long. So if you listen to the footage, you can hear a car actually going up the road real slowly, driving past the house. And we're sitting at the boat dock and we're doing calls and I hear this car coming. And just as I hear this car coming, I'm, I'm paying attention to the car. I start hearing this noise that you heard on the recording. The response. The response. And I'm like, is that a dog? Because there are people that live on that road. And he has neighbors probably half a mile up the hill from him, and his parents live right across the road. So I'm thinking, well, maybe it's a neighborhood dog. And Sean looks at me and says, no, that's not a dog. So I start listening to the sound a little more closely and realize that, no, it's it's not a dog I'm hearing. It, it, if it were a dog, it, it did not sound like a coyote. It did not sound like any kind of dog I've ever heard howl. I just didn't – I couldn't recognize it. But it sounded like it was coming from the front yard where this car literally had just drove by. So I thought, well, maybe somebody dropped the dog off or maybe it was somebody playing a prank on us. So I jump off the boat dock deck and run around the trail towards the front of the house and get up there and thinking, okay, well, if there is a creature there and I'm hearing it there or somebody's playing a prank on us, I'm going to see it one way or the other. Right. And I get up to the front of the house and I look through the, the big open yard and there's nothing there, but I still hear the sounds coming from the woods behind the house. So I, I pinpointed it. Uh, it's coming from that area. So I run back down the trail, and this is a good 100, 150 yards, and I'm booking high speed. I get back to Sean and Dwayne, who are still doing their calls, and I'm like, guys, there's something in the back of the woods, and I tell Sean to do another call. Sean does another whoop call, and it answers him again. And I said, well, let me, let, let me try one of my calls. So I did the Bobo-type yell, and sure enough, it responded back to me. So we're like looking at each other like, oh, my God, there's something in this woods that's not a dog. We don't know what it is. Let's go into the woods and see. So we had um, thermal vision, our night vision, and we had thermal flare. We jump off the porch, and all three of us down this trail behind Sean's house into the forest. And we get down to the bottom of the hill just before his barn, which is in the backyard of his property, and we can hear something moving away from us very quickly. And I happen to turn to look over my shoulder, and I see what I thought were reddish eyes looking back at me for a quick second, but then they looked like they turned and just into the, the, the thick, dark trees right and that's the last i saw it but we could definitely hear something moving away from us the closer we got to it so you got close so you... we were whatever it was whether it was a dog or a dog man or a bigfoot i don't know but whatever we were getting close to we were getting close to it because it was moving away we could hear the branches breaking wow. the brush trampling as it was moving and it didn't sound like bipedal footsteps like people walking it just sounded like brush cramp tramping crunch, and crunch. crunching and yeah breaking branches and all kinds of chaos as this thing went through the, the the trees and once we got down to his barn it got quiet we didn't hear any more of it we we never heard it moving away from us it just got real quiet um, the tree peepers the frogs that you hear in the video they were still making noise and they were still peeping um, so we stood there for about 10 or 15 minutes looking around with flashlights night vision we didn't see anything so we decided let's go back up to the the boathouse and hang out a little bit more and try to do some more calls, some more wood knocks to see if we get more responses. We didn't get anything the rest of the night. It, just after that one experience where we caught, 
um, it was quiet. So I was like, I have recorders that we um, put throughout the forest in different locations and hoping that if something came around, it would, ca it would capture the sound. And I use something called uh, a Zoom um, H2N, which is a Zoom recorder. Um, it's about that big. It's black. It has. Are you uh, saying Zoom as in like Microsoft Zoom? No, Zoom, Zoom. Oh, Zoom. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I think it's called a Zoom H2N, and it's um. It has four four microphones on and built into the uh, the digital recorder, so you can record in in all around you, 180 degrees. So and is it sound activated, or does it con just record? It, it's constantly rolling. Yeah. Okay. I I don't want to. I've tried using the sound activation stuff, and if something trips because of a sound that's activated, you miss part of the beginning of it. Yeah. So I put recorders out there, and I just leave them and let them run. That's what we did with this. So I got home that night, and I, I went through all the audio stuff, and you hear us acting like goofballs and me running down the road chasing after it. But sure enough, you can hear um, this animal clearly making the calls and clearly responding to what we were doing. You can hear Sean doing his whoops, which you see in the show, you hear it answer, yeah. and it doesn't just do like a 10-second clip. This went on for almost 15 minutes. Wow. And it was loud. Um, being there in person was much louder than you hear on the recording. They actually had to boost. I boosted up the uh, sound so they could hear it. They put it on the show, and you can barely hear it unless you turn your TV way up. But in person, it was very loud. And, and to me, it sounded like a dog. It sounded like some kind of canine, but... The more I listen to it, I'm thinking, well, maybe it's not a dog. I've never heard a dog howl like that. I've never heard a canine howl like that. So I don't know what it was. Um, but um, Sean had, uh, I think he had a Zoom H2N recorder as well, or he had a, a, some kind of recorder. Um, two nights after I had left and um, went home, Sean got a hold of me and said, hey, last night about 3 o'clock in the morning, I was woken up by this thing. It came back to the property. It was howling. It was making all kinds of noise. I went out on the porch and started doing the whoop calls, and sure enough, it started answering me back. Oh, my gosh. So Sean has a second recording of that, and it's only like a maybe a 30-second to a minute clip that he actually recorded it, but he was on his porch for about 15 minutes recording it again, and then it just disappeared into the woods. Since that point, he never heard from it or anything like it in his neighborhood or his yard or property since. Wow. Yeah, so That's it was, amazing. It was very compelling um, evidence. Yeah. What it is, I don't know. Um, could have been a Bigfoot. Could have been a dog. I'm not familiar with. Sure. I just don't know. Um, but it, it was it was definitely an interesting experience. Um, I still have the actual original audio um, of the, the clips. I have one that I cut down for time and for um, enhancing and increasing the volume on the creature so you could clearly hear it. And I have Sean's actual clip that's about 30 seconds to a minute long of him doing his whoops. And then I have the original um, recording that it's probably about 10 or 15 minutes of you hear us. You hear me going, is that a dog? Responding the first time we heard it. And then you hear me running down the trail. You hear my feet doo -doo 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 -doo, running down to the front yard to see it. And then you hear me coming back and I'm like, there's nobody in the front yard. And the banter between Dwayne, Sean and I as we were trying to figure out where it was coming from and then chasing off after it. So... It was it was pretty intense. Um, it was an interesting experience, but unfortunately, that's the only audio that we've captured of whatever it was. Well, it sounds like when you guys got up close to it, it you scared it off basically. And I think he came back that one last night to say, "Fuck you for getting me out of here," <laughs> and I'm out. And then he left. Yeah. What's what's really I found what really also was interesting is Sean had at the time had very large dogs. I think he had a Mastiff. Um, I know he had a St. Bernard and I think he had a Doberman chained out outside to, to guard the property and to keep watch over the animals because there are coyotes in the area. And when this thing was responding, the dogs were not barking. They weren't howling. They were just quiet, deadly uh, quiet. Yeah. So this was some kind of they just were like, oh, we're invisible we're not even here like yeah yeah so it was some kind of predator that they were yes. aware of and they were afraid of because usually they're if you go back there in the woods they bark and they make themselves known and just even during the daylight they bark at you and they're right. big it's, dogs yeah and yeah so i thought that was intriguing but again it doesn't prove anything other than there was something there that night that they didn't like um that they were intimidated by and um 
guess we'll never know. But it was fun being on with the, the Ghost Brothers. Um, my overall take on this segment was even the show. It's more tongue in cheek than it is trying yeah. to scare you. They're making fun, or not making fun, but having fun with these clips. And and if you watch it, they were talking about uh, making Bigfoot making love and yeah. and me doing uh, Bigfoot calls with soul and and putting my heart and soul in it and mm-hmm. you know, just laughing at it. And then the, the, the whoop calls at the very end, they kept in that segment. And yeah, you know, which all I time. actually thought was pretty cool that you got them all whooping at the end. Like, yeah, it was funny. It, it, was, it was funny. It was a fun segment I did with them. It was nice to talk to Jack and, and the, the ghost brothers were really cool. Yeah. Uh, they're really nice guys. Um, and I think that's the purpose of the show is just to have fun and to kind of rid, rib more each other. hearted yeah. type of show yeah. yeah that's that's what i got from it too was yeah you know I, I know jack takes the paranormal seriously mm-hmm. um but but i think he sees uh, an opportunity of of presenting it in an in a more playful way um yeah. so you know best of luck to him and and his show with the ghost brothers i guess yeah um, i think from what i understand it's got a little bit of a following that's gaining momentum and um, they have a full season, first season, and if it picks up steam, um, it'll be back. But if you're a fan of, of Jack's actual paranormal work, he has uh, Portals to Hell Season 3 coming out. With Katrina with Whiteman. Katrina. Yeah. So that'll be coming out sometime this year. So Maybe we should try and get Jack and Katrina on as a guest, now that you've talked we've, to Jack. We've had Katrina on before. I know, with got... Nick Groff. Nick Groff, yeah. So When they did um, Paranormal Lockdown. Which reminds me, that was one last thing I wanted to mention, and that is um, Nick Groff, who was previously a part of the Ghost Adventures and went on to do his own show, Paranormal Lockdown, Ghost of Shepherdstown, Death Walker, and I'm missing one, but he's doing a giveaway oh, where cool. he's, uh, there's this contest that you can enter. And the grand prize is when uh, you get to investigate the Hinsdale house, the Hinsdale house with yeah. him. Um, and you get to, he'll fly you down there. You get to have dinner with him and the team. You get to investigate the Hinsdale house with him and flies you home. And I think he's going to give you like 500 bucks just to spend while you're there. Um, so if anybody's <laughs> interested in joining that, or, you know, figuring out how to get into that uh, competition, you hit me up on uh, Facebook, and I will send you a link to the competition. I think you're in it, too, so you know what I'm doing. Do, are you doing the competition? No. Oh, you're not? <laughs> oh, no. I thought I, I, like, I like Nick. I'm glad Nick got away from Ghost Adventures, and he's doing his own thing and, and very successful at what he's doing. Yeah. He, yeah. He's a nice guy. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I liked Ghost Adventures because of Nick, and yeah. I think he was, he was the one that had the most integrity and and sincerity and i and i feel like that's why he broke away from the ghost adventures it was a we need to fabricate and he was like no i'm not gonna be a part of that yeah i think so yeah i don't don't know him personally other than just yeah i that's speculation yeah neither yeah i don't don't know the story behind why he left but i'm glad he did i'm glad he's on his own doing his own thing i think his shows are much more enjoyable and, and have more integrity than ghost adventures that's just my opinion Hey, same here. So don't don't sue me. I'm not bad mouthing you or trashing. No. I'm just giving you my honest opinion. Yes. So. All but. right. Well, that wraps up our first uh, episode of this year. Um, everybody, please subscribe to the channel. The more subscribers we get, um, the better we look. So yay, that'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and you won't miss when our new episodes come out. So uh, definitely click that subscribe button. And until the next episode, stay scared.